And where do people end up after the government denies them chances for a decent education or a decent job? In the clutches of the worst government roadblock of them all, the dependency of the welfare system. This is where we lived, the Richard Allen Project of North Philadelphia. My father deserted us when I was three, so occasionally my mother had to take welfare. But she didn't like it, so she took work as a domestic servant whenever she could. Back then, welfare wasn't a way of life. My mother only received $25 a week. Almost any job paid more than that. So even if she wanted to stay on welfare, she had very little incentive to do so. The changes in welfare benefits uh, during the 1960s were quite large. If you take the case of a woman going on AFDC in a, in a typical industrial state, I'll, I'll take Pennsylvania as an example, in 1960 she would have gotten about $23, which in 1980 purchasing power was about $63. By 1970, she could have gotten benefits conservatively estimated not tapping all of the possible sources of support, but, but a, a minimal package that would amount to about $134 in 1980 purchasing power. By way of comparison, a minimum wage job in 1960 only paid $111 in 1980 purchasing power. In other words, in 1970, the AFDC plus other forms of benefits were providing purchasing power somewhat greater than you could make by working 40 hours a week at a minimum wage job only 10 years earlier. I came from a broken home, but in my day that was unusual. Black families were almost as stable as white families. The black family did not start falling apart until the 1960s, as more blacks were lured into the welfare culture. And this came in two ways. One way was that prevented the formation of families, that is, fostered illegitimacy. And it's easy to understand how this happened. Just imagine that you're a 16-year-old girl in some ghetto apartment. Uh, you scarcely know your father. He occasionally visits. Perhaps he's drunk a lot of the time. He doesn't have a job. Uh, your mother is under terrible stress trying to discipline her boys who are often out, the, out in the streets in gangs. The neighborhood is rife with crime. Uh, within the household itself, there are serious tensions between you and your mother. Uh, it, it's just a very difficult and trying way of life. And the government, however, offers a deal to this 16-year-old girl. It says you can leave all this. You can have liberation in an apartment of your own. You can have access to some 17 different social programs. You can have free medical care, free legal assistance if you need it. You can have several hundred dollars a, a month free, all on one condition. And that one condition is that you have an illegitimate child. And this isn't a racial problem. It's not had nothing to do with blacks uh, as a race. Uh, indeed, in Sweden, where they have an even more ample welfare state, 40 percent of all Swedish children are born out of wedlock. In my day, no able-bodied adult male could receive welfare or even live in a household that received welfare. We were lucky. There was no way we could be sucked into the welfare trap. When you talk about young men getting into the working market uh, labor force during the 1960s, I think one of the saddest stories is that they were told not to, to do those things which were eventually going to bring them out of poverty permanently, which is to say that a young man, uh, before the advent of a lot of these changes, not only had to hang on to that, in quotes, dead-end job, by hanging on to it, he was also establishing a record as a reliable worker. And as time went on, he had more and more chances to establish a more secure job and get a better income. Once it became more rational for him to drift in and out of the labor market, having a job for a while, then not having a job and putting together a package of welfare benefits, perhaps getting some money from a woman he was living with, perhaps getting some money in the underground economy, that would increase his income in the short term, 
But when he got to be 23, 24 years old, he had already labeled himself in his own eyes and in the eyes of the labor market as an unreliable worker who is qualified only for the worst possible jobs. In other words, the welfare state tells you that you're optional, that all your struggles, all your labors in the workforce are unnecessary that, as a matter of fact, that you can support your wife and children best by leaving them. That's the deal that uh, the welfare state offers uh, th the man in the ghetto. And not surprisingly, over the years, increasing numbers of men have left their families in the ghetto. Back in my day, to be called a welfare kid was almost as bad as being called a nigger. But because of so-called welfare reforms, many of the kids who live here know nothing else. They may never learn to pull themselves out of poverty one step at a time. Like some giant drug pusher, their government has lured them into dependency on a system that will maintain them in permanent poverty. In every respect, welfare reform has backfired. 20 years after we declared war on poverty, poverty has won. Restrictive labor laws, minimum wages, public schools, jobs programs, and a maze of welfare programs have all been prescribed as weapons in the war against poverty. But poverty is winning. These people are poor, but they don't have to stay poor for their intelligent, honest and potentially hardworking persons. Can they make it on their own? Given the right kind of help, of course they can. The solution is quite simple. Give parents greater control over their children's education by setting up a tuition tax credit or voucher system, which will broaden parental choice by introducing competition and in turn revitalize our public and non-public schools. Remove the burden of the minimum wage from youngsters Teenagers need early work experiences to learn the world of work, and yes, make mistakes while they're young. That way, they become more valuable as adult workers. Eliminate government roadblocks that prevent fledgling entrepreneurs from starting their own business. Enact a compassionate welfare system, such as a negative income tax that removes demeaning dependency and disincentives. America's long tradition of converting poor people into middle class people can be extended to today's poor by giving them the right to make their own decisions. As Martin Luther King said, let freedom ring. Let it ring in the schools, the job markets, and the neighborhoods across the land. And then we can all be free, free at last. Freedom, freedom. Good Intentions was produced by Imagine Incorporated, which is solely responsible for its content.